Heavenly Father, thank you for your love to us today. Thank you so much for the privileges that are ours. Thank you that we can find joy and peace and strength in your word. Thank you that your word has an answer for every human emotion, every trial that we can ever face. Please forgive us for all the times when we have not showed you forth as divine in our lives by trying to do things ourselves. Thank you so much for your promise today that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. We're thankful that you're here today. We're thankful that you brought us here safely. We pray for the Holy Spirit to teach us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. A few days ago, I was uh, at the YMCA, and I got on the treadmill, as I typically do, and I put the uh, treadmill up on an elevation, so it felt like I was going on an up toward, like up, up a mountain, and I had the incline at about 10 which is pretty pretty good incline and I had the speed down low and I walked for oh probably about a mile with a high incline and then I started to run and I dropped the incline down and I got to I had the incline down at 8 and I had the speed up to about oh about 5 miles an hour and all of a sudden in my mind I'm thinking to myself you know, I really don't feel like running today. What am I doing? I, I just, I feel sluggish. I don't want to continue. But then the other side of my mind said, well, you know, if you stop today, then the next time it'll be a whole lot easier to stop. And so while I'm sitting there running and sweat pouring off my face and my legs are starting to tighten and feel hurt and my chest is starting to hurt because I'm breathing hard. My mind's saying, why did you stop today? And I thought, no, I'm not. So I kept right on going, elevated the speed, got it up to about five and a half miles an hour and finished my, my run of, oh, about two and a half miles. Well, yesterday I got, I finished exercising with weights and I got on the machine again. Well, yesterday I didn't feel like it at all. At all. I didn't feel like doing it. And typically, if I do it four days a week, that fifth day, it's, it's a hit and miss. Well, I got on the machine and I started, this time I put it at an incline of 11, started elevating the speed and the sweat's starting to pour out and I'm starting and I'm going through the conflict in my mind again and I thought no I'm gonna run so I keep going lo and behold the the treadmill next to me was a police officer uh, I know that not because he was dressed in his police uniform on the treadmill but because I've chatted with him and so he starts his machine up and he's going along and, and another fellow police officer of his, there's several that work out because they want to stay in shape uh, in case they run into somebody that wants to fight them. So they're talking, these two policemen, and I'm sitting there and, and I'm going on and, and moving out and I've got it up a mile and three-fourths and mile 1.8, 1.85. And this police officer stops and he leaves. Well, the other guy keeps on with his treadmill and he's going. Well, I got to about two miles. 
And I said, you know, that's enough. I've sweated enough. My legs have burned enough. I'm done. So I start slowing the machine down. I get it to 3, 3, 7, 3, 6, 3, 5. And I'm just walking along. And all of a sudden, this police officer, he says, uh, he says, Bill, do you guys have church services on Saturday nights? Now, folk, if I had kept running my normal speed, my normal distance, I probably wouldn't have gotten this conversation with him. Because when I've got it up at five miles an hour and the incline's eight, don't talk to me. <laughs> I'm not interested in talking. Do you hold church services Saturday night at your church? The machine was at 3.5. I looked at him. I could look. I could even turn with the machine going that slow. And I said, no, Hal. Uh, we don't meet Saturday nights. We meet Saturday morning from around 9.30 to 1. Um, but no, we don't hold services Saturday nights. He looked at me and he said, Saturday morning? Why do you hold them Saturday morning? I said, well, Hal, there's, there's no place in the Bible that you will find where God says that we, need, we should go to church on Sunday. I said, it's not there. And um, I said, the only place where the Bible talks about, the only day the Bible talks about going to church on is Sabbath or Saturday. Well, we engaged in conversation and, uh, you know, it came around. We talked on a host of subjects for probably the next 20 minutes. We went from Sabbath to faith to trusting the Bible separate from uh, trusting men to uh, something he was struggling with. He said it had to do with uh, his, his paying tithe. And, you know, I was sharing Bible verses with Hal and saying how God wants you to prove him. God wants you to trust him. God wants you to accept nothing, Hal, but that which you can find in his word. And he was telling me, he said, my pastor wants to have church services Saturday night and Sunday morning. And Hal said, but I told him, I said, pastor, you're going to wear those people out. And uh, Hal's wife, who is much more in-depth in the Bible, said, Dear, it's just the pastor is trying to test people's faith. And so Hal said, Bill, what do you think about that? And I said, Hal, logic says, reasoning says, if you have too many church services too close together, eventually people are just going to wear out and, and they're not going to come. He said, you know, that's what I thought. And he said, but my wife said it's a spiritual issue. And I said, how, you know, the Bible says, God says to us, he says, come now, let's reason together. I said, how God is not illogical, he's not unreasonable. Spiritual things and logic, Hal, I said, they're not fighting against each other. I said, God is reasonable. God is logical. He said, where's that verse found? I've got to find that. I've got to show that to my wife. So I told him, I said, it's in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. You say, Bill, I didn't come here this morning to hear about your trip to the YMCA yesterday. What's your point? My point is this. When I walked away from that meeting with Hal, I thought, if I had not got on the treadmill and I had just headed straight out, I would have never spoken to Hal about that yesterday. If I had run my normal run yesterday, I wouldn't have spoken to Hal either. But you know what, folk? I, I figured out something that God is interested in one thing in this world, and that is evangelism. God is so interested in our neighbors, in our family, 
in our friends, in our community, in our city, in our state. He is so interested in people learning about how loving He is that He can do just about anything. That's how interested God is. And God loves how this policeman from Astatula so much that even though I felt like not even getting on the treadmill, I got on the treadmill. And then God made sure that I wasn't on it long enough so I'd have time to talk to Hal yesterday because God knew that was on his mind and he wanted answers. And so I didn't run my normal run yesterday because Hal had questions. You know, as I study the New Testament, I realized, and I was doing it this week, and that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. Do you know that God allowed controversy and problems to come to the early church simply because he wanted to do evangelism? Do you realize that? And the story I want to look at, at least start with it this morning, is the man Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Because it, you start with the story of Cornelius and it begins to develop a controversy in the Christian church. I want to take a look at that with you this morning. And over the next several times that I'm here, we're going to look at this in a process. But I want to start with Cornelius. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10 tells us, was a centurion. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, was Cornelius the first centurion that desired to know about the Jews' God? Was he the first one? Uh-uh. There was the man, the centurion in Capernaum. We find, we read about him in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 12. Then, of course, there was the next centurion, the one in Jerusalem, who had said when he saw Jesus die, truly this was the Son of God. So there were several centurions, the most unlikely people to accept Christ. A miracle. A miracle. A centurion. A centurion was raised in army camps. They say that the Roman armies were full of men that were homosexuals. That's what these centurions were raised in. It was complete heathenism, immorality, filth. Not only were they raised in that, but they were hardened people. You, you can't kill somebody and do that for a long period of time in your life without it making you hard. You can't. And so this centurion was a hardened soldier. Hard soldier. But miracle of miracles, the Holy Spirit worked with Cornelius. Verse 2 tells us about him. It says he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. That's a miracle, folks. A hardened centurion of Rome, the iron legs of the beast of Daniel 7 or excuse me, the uh, image in Daniel 2, the nondescript beast of Daniel chapter 7. Here was Cornelius, a part of that nondescript beast. He prayed to God. He feared God. He was devoted to God. And an angel came to him. Verse 3 tells us, verse 4 the angel says to Cornelius at the end of the verse, Your prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now verse 5, Now send men to Joppa. Call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. 
He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Do you realize that was trouble? The angel said for Cornelius to send men to who? Who was it? Nellie, say it a little bit louder. To Peter. Now, folk, do you realize what that angel was saying? Peter was a Jew. Was a Jew to have anything to do with a Gentile heathen dog? No. For Peter to go to Cornelius' house, you don't do things like that. Peter was not supposed to go to the house of Cornelius or any Greek or any Gentile because the Gentiles were unclean. He shouldn't do that. Peter knew it. The Jews knew it. They were an exclusive people. They were the holy people of God. They were God's chosen people and they were to have nothing to do with those heathens. So Cornelius' men start off towards Joppa. And as they head towards Joppa, Acts chapter 10 picks up the story about Peter. Verse 9. It's getting close to noon. Peter's getting ready to eat. He's getting hungry. But the meal's not ready yet. So verse 9 tells us that on the morrow, as Cornelius' men, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city of Joppa, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which is about noon. Verse 10, he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So here's the case. Some heathen dogs, some Gentiles are heading towards Joppa. Peter's hungry. Peter's a Jew. He's a holy, self-righteous Jew that has nothing to do with the heathen. He gets hungry, goes up on the housetop, and he's praying, and he's hungry, and he falls into a trance. Verse 11 says, And Peter saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein, verse 12, were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. So Peter sees all these animals on this sheet. And the, the voice says, Peter, eat them, you're hungry. Eat all those unclean animals. And maybe even some clean animals. Peter says, no way. I don't eat things that are common or unclean. Peter says, I'm a Jew, I'm a healthy person. I don't eat any kind of stuff like that. Verse 15, the voice spake to him again the second time what God has cleansed. That call not thou common. Now many people would look at that at the end of verse 15 right there and say, See, I can eat whatever I want to. It doesn't matter if there were health laws in the Old Testament. I can eat whatever I want. I can eat shrimp. I can eat lobster. I can eat pig. I can eat this. I can eat, I can eat whatever I want. Because the verse says, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. And he's obviously talking there about food. That's the context. 
So that means if I want to go out and get my pork chops or I want to go out and get a nice plate of lobster or crabs or shrimp or whatever, God cleansed it, I can eat it. Right? That's the context. Or is it? Verse 16, this was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So let's see what we've got so far. A heathen Roman centurion is sending his men to an upright, honest, pure Jew, Peter, to ask him to come to his home, which is unlawful for Peter to do. It's unlawful for Peter to do that. And Peter knows that. And so Peter has this vision and he sees all these unclean animals and the, the voice says, the angel says, Peter, eat all these unclean animals. And Peter says, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the angel says, what God has cleansed, don't you dare call common or unclean. Okay, so that's the whole scenario. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is Peter being told that he can eat anything under the sun, anything that jumps and can see you? Or is Peter being told something about the men that are coming to Joppa? That's what we've got a question in our minds at this point in these passages. What, what is Peter's vision all about? Is it to say we can eat anything we want? Or does it have to do with those heathen men that are coming from Caesarea to Joppa? Okay? Verse 17, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Peter wasn't sure what it could mean. So he's thinking about it. He's wondering. He's questioning himself. And it says, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Verse 19, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. What's the point? The Spirit of God says, Peter, there's three men that are coming to you right now. You go with them and you don't doubt for one moment that I sent them. Now why would Peter doubt? What doubts would an upright, noble Jew have about being with three heathen men from Cornelius's band. What doubts would he have? Peter would say, wait a minute. They're, they're unclean. They're, it's not right for me to be with them. I can't go with them. But the Holy Spirit said, Peter, you go with them. Don't doubt for a minute that I sent you. Why... Why did the Holy Spirit say, when those three men come, you go with them? Why? Because all God cares about is people who want to know Him. And God will do whatever is necessary to find a means to let them understand His love for them. He'll do anything. He'll break any barrier, knock down any wall to make sure that happens. So Peter goes with the men. Verse 22. They said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God. Do you notice how Cornelius' men describe him? They say, Cornelius the centurion. And Peter, right away, he's saying... He's a heathen. I can't, I can't be around that guy. I can't go into his house. But 
They then say, he's a fair man, he's a just man, and not only that, he fears God. He fears the same God you do, Peter. They're trying to break down the walls. He's also of good report among all the nation of the Jews. Peter, he not only fears your God, but the Jews respect him. He's respectable. He was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Now, notice verse 23. This, this is great. Then called he them in and lodged them. Peter invites them into his home, takes care of them, feeds them, lets them sleep in his house. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them by himself. Was it just Peter and, and Cornelius' men that went to, uh, to Caesarea? Listen to what the Bible says. Peter went with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Why? Was Peter scared? Was he afraid that those three men might hurt him? Why did Peter take with him some fellow Jews, Jewish Christian men, why did he take them with him to go to Cornelius' house? Because Peter knew that he was treading on thin ice. He knew he was going to have a lot of questions he was going to have to answer once he left Cornelius' home. So he said, fine, I'm going to take some other brothers so they can witness exactly what happens. Peter was covering his bases. He was sharp. He was sharp. Now, go on down, verse 25. Peter and the men get to Cornelius' home, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Now listen to verse 28 very, very clearly. He said to them, Peter said to them, to Cornelius, and all of those heathen people, that the Jews would consider to be heathens, you know how that, that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. Now, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God told Peter not to call any man common or unclean? I thought Peter saw a vision of animals. And Peter was told to eat them and it was all about health and what was good to eat and what's not good to eat. No, it's not. Peter now understood what that vision of all those animals on that sheet was about it had nothing to do with food. It had nothing to do with what's healthy, what God had enjoined upon the Jews in the Old Testament, and what God enjoins on us today. It had nothing to do with health. It all had to do with breaking down barriers between Jews and Gentiles. And God was trying to teach Peter that there is no difference between a Jew and a Greek. Between one of God's people and a Gentile heathen. God said, Peter, there is no difference. Christ came to die for the Jew and the Gentile. 
God has showed me I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter speaks to them. Cornelius gives his testimony. Verse 30, 31, 32, 33. Then in verse 34, Peter preaches a short sermon. Probably, well, here it's only about 10, 11 verses. Which, you know, it could have taken as much as 45 or 50 minutes. Verse 44 says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And verse 45, And they of the circumcision, who's that talking about? Jews. Those who had come with Peter, those who entered into Cornelius' house to make sure that well, they weren't sure why they were there. They weren't sure. They of the circumcision which believed were thrilled. Doesn't that, that's what your Bible says, isn't it? Charlotte, what's it say? They were astonished. What? What? What's going on here? They were astonished. Why were they astonished? That's right, Rodney. The Jews were shocked. These people, are, they're not circumcised. And, and look what it says, verse 45. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did the people know that the Holy Ghost had been poured out at Cornelius' house? How did they know it? Because Cornelius and all the people in the room, they began to speak foreign languages. The Bible says, verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. You mean to tell me the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family and his friends, and they weren't circumcised? That's shocking, isn't it? They spoke foreign languages, and the Jews were shocked. Because they realized in those foreign languages that the Holy Spirit had fallen upon that group. They were amazed. And Peter baptized them. Verse 47, 48. Do you know that this chapter right here was the beginning of strife and controversy that the Apostle Paul and all of the Apostles, they constantly face that for all their ministry. Do you realize that? Because Peter and Paul and Barnabas and Silas and the disciples, they all recognized over a period of time, and we're gonna, hopefully we'll see some more of it this morning, over time, they recognized that what God was most interested in was evangelizing the world. Not just the Jews, the world. The world, folks. So what happened after this? I say there's controversy, there's, there's trial. Who got upset? Acts chapter 11. 
Notice what happened, verses 1 and 2. The apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Contended with him? Verse 3, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them? <gasps> oh, my. You can see some of the people that said that to Peter. You can see some of them falling, can't you? I mean, they're just, <gasps> you know, I mean, they're, they're just collapsing. Peter, you, you went in and, and you ate with Gentiles? How dare you do such a thing? How could you? Folk, this issue never died. It never died. The Jews of the first century, they stuck with this and they gave Peter and Paul and all of the disciples they gave them gray hairs because they were so bent on maintaining the rituals, the ordinances they had been given as a people. They were bent on that. And folk, right here in Acts 10 and 11, this was the controversy that raged throughout the Mediterranean world. Paul preached Christ. The unbelieving Jews preached circumcision and feast days. Paul exalted Jesus. As we read the remainder of the New Testament, we must understand, we must understand that this is the issue that Paul had to meet again and again and again. And that's why he wrote about it in Romans 14, in Colossians, in Galatians. This was what Paul was contending with throughout his ministry. Now, let's watch how it develops a little bit longer here this morning. Go on down to Acts chapter 15. The, the intermittent chapters, Acts 11, 12, 13. Acts 12, Peter is imprisoned. Acts 13, you have some of Paul and Barnabas' missionary work. Acts 14, you have the same thing. Because now it's not only Peter that's gotten into the, the fire, so to speak, but Paul and Barnabas have too. They're going all over. Antioch, Pamphylia, Thessalonica, Berea. And eventually in Acts 16, they're going to go to Macedonia, to the Philippines, uh, to the uh, people of Philippi, not the Philippines, excuse me. Getting a little bit too far east. <laughs> but folk, Paul and Barnabas get into the mix now too. And so we read in Acts chapter 15. Watch this. Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except... Ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses. What'd they say? You can't be saved. They said, if, if you want to be accepted before God, you have to be circumcised. And the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, Peter, other apostles... They said that acceptance before God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. 
That's where acceptance comes. But the Jews, they said, no, if you want to be saved, you must be circumcised. Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, what happened? Paul and Barnabas, they were at sword points with these people. Sword points with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. So folk, we have in Acts chapter 15 the first great church council in the first century. Paul and Barnabas and other brethren go up to Jerusalem to Jesus Jesus' brother James, who was the head of the council in Jerusalem. John's brother James had already been killed by the sword, but this James that we read about in Acts chapter 15, this was Jesus' brother. James was the son of Joseph of his first marriage. So they went up to Jerusalem to determine what gospel would be preached. Would it be the gospel of circumcision or would it be the gospel of Christ? Verse 3, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they decreed, declared all things that God had done with them. Now verse 5, here we go again. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Well, what was the law of Moses that the Pharisees were saying had to be kept? Folk, it was all of those aspects of the, the law that were ceremonial. It was circumcision. It was sacrifice. It was feast days. All of those things were involved in the Jewish or the law of Moses, which was ceremonial. And the Pharisees, which believed, said, all of the Gentile converts, they've got to be circumcised, they've got to keep the feast days, they've got to offer sacrifice. That's what they said. Now you can imagine what happened. You can imagine who it was who stood up in this council and spoke at that point. It was Peter. Peter always had something to say. But not only did Peter have something to say, it was Peter who had first had the experience at Cornelius' home. Verse 7. When there had been much disputing. What does that mean? They got together in meetings and they were just going at each other's throats. Several hours, several days, they're arguing and fighting over what do the Gentiles have to do? Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What's Peter talking about? Who were the Gentiles that believed? Cornelius and his family. Absolutely, Rodney. Verse 8, And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did to us. 
Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Folk, in the final analysis, in the final analysis, that's all that really matters right there. That's all that really matters. Will we or will we not allow Christ to purify our hearts by faith? That's the question. That's the question. Those people out there who keep Sunday today, if they are allowing Christ to purify their heart by faith, do you know what day they're going to end up keeping? Saturday. That's right. And those Seventh-day Adventists who are refusing to allow Christ to purify their heart by faith, do you know what day they will eventually worship on? Sunday. That's right. That's right. Verse 10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. At this council in Jerusalem, the brethren decided that the Gentile converts did not have to be circumcised, did not have to keep the feast days, did not have to observe the laws of Moses. They decided that. The only things they enjoined on the Gentiles, verse 19 and 20, notice what it says. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which are which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Now what is involved in verse 20? Watch. Stay away from the pollution of idols. Which commandment in the law of God said to stay away from idols? The second commandment. That's right. And which commandment says to stay away from fornication? Which commandment? The seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay? So you have in what was enjoined on the Gentiles... Honor the first table of the law. Honor the second table of the law. Don't worship idols. That's on the first table. Stay away from fornication and adultery. That's on the second table. The other part, from things strangled and from blood. What does that have to do with anything? Stay away from blood? Does that mean if somebody gets a cut, you're supposed to stay away from them? What's it talking about? Number one, it's talking about don't, don't kill somebody. I believe it also has reference to the fact that when we eat, we don't eat things with blood in it. You know, it's very, very interesting. In all the things that God allowed the Israelites to eat from the Old Testament that were flesh, all the way back till the days of Noah, when God first said, okay, you can eat flesh food, that's because there was nothing else. Folk, God always said, if a person opts to eat flesh, Certain kinds of flesh. Okay. But he said, you be sure there's no blood in it.
how often folk today who justify eating flesh food don't follow through on that injunction. Don't eat it with blood. That's what the people at Jerusalem counseled on. But folk, if we want to understand the New Testament and the writings of the Apostle Paul, we must understand the controversy that Paul faced in the first century. If we don't, then we're going to come up with all kinds of ideas that will lead us astray. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the beauty of your word. Thank you that there is a harmony in scripture that is so precious from Genesis to Revelation. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth so that we can set forth before anybody and everybody the harmony and beauty of your word. Bless us to search its pages that we might be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks us a reason of the hope that is within us. In Jesus' name, amen.